Let me introduce you to synthesizer engineer Tatsuya Takahashi, the CEO of Cork Germany, who has 10 years at Cork Tokyo. He brought us the monotrons, the Volcas, the Minilog, and many more before leaving on a three-year hiatus from mass-produced synthesizer. So I'm very curious to see, because he now returns to Cork to set up and run uh, its newly established Berlin lab. So let us discover his world, and I'm calling him on stage. Please, I'm so excited to have you there. This is fantastic in real life. Uh, yes, I, I leave you for 25 minutes with the instruments, and I will be back for the Q&As five minutes before we finish. Have Thank fun! You so much. Wow, this is a. Uh, I feel tiny on this massive stage here. Um, you probably can't see it on the stream, but there's a 270-degree screen going around the room. Um, so. Um, yeah, what do I say? Uh, after that very big intro, um, my name is Tats. I design synthesizers. Um, I am now the CEO of Cork Germany, which is a synthesizer or a musical instrument tech company. Um, and I realize this is a, it's, it's an industry event, but uh, I really don't want to talk about too much about industry. Um, and I'd like to not turn this into an advert for the products I've designed. I'd rather not turn it into an advert for Korg or for, for me personally. Um, and I wanted to just talk about the creative process. Um, of course, I'm here and I'm afforded this stage because I guess for the success of the products I've designed. But um, there is a deeper um, running kind of undercurrent to all the work that I do. And I think that's the more interesting aspects of instrument design rather than, um, you know, the big hits uh, that have been coming out from Korg. So um, usually um, I present the, the stuff that I've worked on in chronolo chronological order, um, but I decided not to do this this time. And I will be going through uh, the designs that I've worked on are purely from by using one parameter. And that parameter is how many times a particular design is reproduced. Um, it's a logarithmic scale, so I'm going to be using the powers of 10 to uh, categorize um, the scale in which each design was reproduced. Um, it's also a nod to the the Ray and Charles Eames uh, movie where they show you know, the universe rotating and then they zoom out and then zoom in uh, further and further into smaller and smaller scales and shows the atomic uh, structure being very similar to how the universe is. And I think it's this sense of scale, especially on this logarithmic scale, that um, that gives this universe of, of, of creation and technology and actually, I just want to show that the smaller things aren't um, lesser than the bigger things. And the smaller projects do actually inform the bigger projects uh, quite a lot. So um, the first category is, uh, the first scale I'm going to be using is uh, 10 to the power of 5. Now, that just means 1 with 5 zeros after it, so 100,000. In this category is the, the Volker series. This is one of them. And these came out in 2013. And um, the idea was we came out with, there's nine now, but we came out with three at the time. 
and uh, the idea was to break down music making into more bite-sized uh, elements. So we had one for the rhythm, this one is called the vocal beats, we had one for the bass, we had one for the chords, and the idea was that each one would be so bite-sized that there'll be a, a very nice and a quick learning curve and people could start making music uh, in a very accessible format. Um, I, again, the point of this isn't to kind of boast about how many we sold, but it's more about, um, actually it's the opposite. I think 100,000 is actually quite small if you compare it to how many times mobile phones are made or any kind of, um, you know, white appliance or any of, any other industry has, has bigger numbers. And I think the figure, the starting figure of, of 10 to the 5 actually says a lot about the music tech industry, which is that it's actually not that massive. Um, but anyway, um, and to my knowledge, I actually don't know a million selling uh, hardware music tech product. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, this stuff is on the bigger end of the scale. And what it means for the design is, yes, it has the implications that you can use things like ABS uh, or injection molding. You can do, uh, you can spend more um, development costs on it. You can do things like, you know, more uh, startup heavy processes. But, um, but the real uh, key in designing something for the masses is that you make it instantly recognizable what it does. And this is, yes, it's kind of, you need, uh, you need to get the sound right, you need to get the, the usability right, you need to make it, you know, you really need to nail it musically and functionally, but after having done that, you really need to make sure that people recognize what this does. So the Beats, which is basically a drum machine, takes cues from a very famous uh, drum machine. Uh, we have another one, which is the Volker FM, which takes cues from a very famous uh, FM synthesizer, and so on and so forth. Um, I am, by education, an electronic uh, engineer, but um, I am very, very much, uh, I'm skilled in electronic engineer, but um, I'm very much in um, a kind of industrial design uh, way of thinking when I think about products. So, um, 10 to the 4 is the next scale. Um, I've forgotten what's on this one. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, so there's Minilog there. It was a bit big, so I bought the Monolog instead. Um, so, these are products that generally sell in the range of um, tens of thousands. And or they, they're aimed to be designed for that size of market. Excuse me. And the thing to note here, and we have the Minilog, we have the Monolog here, uh, which is like a monophonic smaller version of the Minilog. Um, also, instruments like the ARP Odyssey is in this category. And basically, um, the common thing is that uh, you'll notice they all have keyboards. And I remember this came out maybe five years into my career at Korg, um, and I'd been making you know, boxes with knobs and buttons. Um, and um, my mother saw the Minilog come out, and that was in 2015, I think. And she just said, oh, so that's what you've been doing all the time. You're making uh, musical synthesizers. And I said, mom, I've always been making musical instruments. What are you talking about? And she says, no, but this is something you can really make music with. And that's when it really hit me that, that all the other things, all these Volkers and the Monotrons and the Monotribes I was making before this, they weren't somehow, for a lot of people, not considered as musical instruments. And that's when I realized the power of these black and white stripes that you put at the, you know, in, in the, on the front of synthesizers, um, and this is what it really communicates. Now, it's got, it's not just advantages being iconic, and in the case of the keyboard, because it's such an established and such a mature interface, you do also need to observe some more established uh, conservative aspects of using a keyboard. Um, but you've also got to dance with tradition to make something new. So that's um, 10 to the 4, tens of thousands. The next scale is 10 to 3. Um, don't quote me on these numbers, by the way, um, because actually uh, 
I don't know the exact <laughs> figure of this, but I imagine this is uh, selling or going to be selling in that range. So um, this is a, a UREC module. It was designed by Maximilian Rest and Christoph Hornelein. Um, at ERM Erfindungsbüro. Um, it's not a core product, but um, I had the pleasure of working on the interface design uh, of this product. And it's basically, I don't know if you can see in the movies, it's uh, a, way, a new way of synthesizing sound and manipulating spectrums using geometry. Now, the Eurac market is very different and very interesting because you can actually have a very, very slow and long learning curve. In fact, I feel like the learning curve is, is the lifetime of a modular product. Uh, with something like the Volker, you need people to get it instantly and to be getting results very quickly. With something like this, you can make it a journey uh, of learning. And it is designed as such. Um, obviously, the, the main point is the geometry and the display, so it has uh, quite a big presence on the panel. And also, I decided to use a lot of the real estate of the panel in communicating signal flow, in communicating uh, the functionality and the logics of how this works. And this isn't something I would do on any other product. Um, and it's very unique to uh, the Eurac market, where people are more studious and uh, where people are more inclined to enjoy this process of learning and discovering how things work. Um, so this was a very unique experience for me. Um, and sure, it's a smaller market than the other stuff we've already talked about, but it is a very deep and a very interesting one um, and a beautiful community. So um, the next one is, I don't have the others by the way, uh, 10 to the 2, which is uh, in the scale of hundreds. So this, by definition, is a hundred. It's a, it's a sound art piece composed by Ryoji Ikeda. Um, and we designed um, a synthesizer specifically for this event. It is, um, or it was, a piece written for 100 cars with huge sound systems. Um, to play sine waves. And we created a handheld device um, that would be operated by the drivers of these crazy tricked out cars with huge sound systems. And the real owners, the drivers of these cars, would play them. Um, most of them had no idea about Ryoji Keda. Most of them had no idea about sound art or um, these performance pieces, but they had to follow a piece of paper, which was a score, um, and operate the synthesizer. So this was a really pure experience in that it was really about identifying um, how to turn car lovers into sound artists. Um, and so we would think about what would be the, the kind of uh, the controls we would have on it. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in the visuals at some point. What would be the, the, the indication of time on it? We had a very large display showing the time in seconds. Um, and um, how simple should it be? How difficult should it be? And that informed the composition, and the composition informed the form factor of the instrument. So this was a very unique experience. And it was also unique that we spent, um, we spent months uh, developing a device uh, that would be used just for this 23-minute piece. Uh, it was very beautiful. It was on uh, the top floor of a car park uh, with the backdrop of the LA sunset, very theatrical, very dramatic. Um, and all our energy was put into these 23 minutes. It was a very um, exciting project for me, um, but also somber at the same time, the way it kind of ended, um, but very pure in its intentions. So when you get to these numbers, these lower numbers, you can afford to be very, very specific about the needs um, that uh, a design, uh, that would be required of a design. Um, the next scale, 10 to 1, I think? Yes, the 10s. So um, I don't know if this is it. Is this it? 
Yes, the granular convolver. So um, another project that we worked on, when I say we, I generally mean me and uh, my partner at Quark Germany, Maximilian Rest. Um, it's, uh, the Grindler Convolver was a very, or is a very abstract instrument. It's one of the more kind of explorative projects that we've done. Um, and what it does is it's a handheld device again. It records the sound. Sorry, I couldn't bring it on the stage here today to show you. Um, and you can slice a grain from that sample. And, and then you can play a real-time into, input into the device, and you can convolve that in real time with that grain that you slice from your audio sample. Um, if that doesn't make sense to you, um, it's not really meant to. And um, that's, that was the real point of this, because it was a device that was made for the Red Bull Music Academy in 2018, which happened in Berlin. Uh, now, the Academy is a place where people from around the world, I think 37 different countries this time, um, uh, gather 60 musicians of all different backgrounds. And basically, it's a hot pot of you know, creative experimentation. And the great thing about this, uh, here you see it, is that um, there's not much, in, it's very kind of, um, Cryptic, you know. There's not much writing on the panel. There is a uh, few, not too many, kind of buttons, but you know, with different sizes and maybe showing uh, the different importance in the functionality. Um, but the great thing about this was that we only made 60 of them for the participants of the academy, and we were able to spend weeks uh, with the participants in figuring out how they should use it, although we didn't really tell them, um, and also for us to discover how they would end up using it in real life and what kind of sounds they would be manipulating with it. And um, so it was an exploration uh, for them in encountering a new uh, instrument and a maybe quite an abstract experimental one. And for us, it was an exploration and a discovery into how they would use it. Um, you usually don't get weeks of attention from the market when you put out a commercial product. So this was a very special uh, product for us. Um, net scale down, 10 to the power of 0 equals 1 is, um, is actually, I call it triggers because I couldn't think of a better name, is uh, it's actually a sequencer and a mixer made for the TR-808, or two TR-808s. Um, I've just brought the sequence apart here with me, um, and gosh, there's like so much in here to explain in a short amount of time. Um, but basically, I have these uh, ROM chips, uh, which end up on the floor, let me drop them. Um, and these contain the sequences. You program this using um, an Excel spreadsheet, actually. And you, b you burn the sequence in here. And the idea was that you can DJ with sequences uh, by swapping out the chips. And you have uh, two turntables, I guess, for this kind of DJ rig. Uh, you also have these bores. And I made, I think, 10 of these. And these carry uh, what you would call the timbers. Um, and then the idea here, again, would be that I can swap out the boards and, and the timbers as if I was uh, playing them like records. Um, these will be connected to two TR-808s, and all the sounds would be actually audio trigger, audio rate triggering of the TR-808 uh, resonators, uh, TR-808 resonators. Uh, all the channels will come back in here. Uh, they'll be mixed on this performance mixer. Um, there's a mid-side uh, effects section here, and. Um, if all that doesn't make sense to you, um, again, it's not really meant to because it was just a project for myself and something that um, was purely 
uh, selfish. You know, I didn't have to think about the market. I didn't think about distributors or the sales departments or uh, any of the the monetary, you know, funding of this. This was just, you know, uh, using my pocket money to to build something for myself that I wanted to use uh, for my performance. Um, so this really uh, was a study in. Um, so many things that I'm interested in, things like how do you uh, associate hardware and how do you use hardware in a way that's like DJing with records? Um, how do you do audio rate triggering, and which is basically uh, analog convolution? You know, it's a study of analog convolution. It's a study of um, uh, using mid side processing, sound processing, as a performance tool. Um, and it's a study of so many different things. And conceptually, it's also um, a study of how to really kind of destroy the TR-808 and also paying homage to it at the same time. So for me, this was a very kind of um, exploration of all the things that I'm really interested in. Um, so from the first scale of 10 to the 5, the hundreds of thousands, down to the single unit designs uh, that I've done. I really don't think there's any hierarchy to all of this. And I don't intend this to be a, a how-to of how to make you know, uh, mass-produced uh, instruments. It's really about the fundamental fact that um, creating with technology is really about discovering, finding solutions to new problems, innovating, um, and experimenting. And, and this, the, the studies that I do and the experiments that I do with a project like this one, which only, um, uh, which is like a, a singularity for me, you know, there's only one thing uh, that exists in this world that does this, but it informs the designs of all the other things I've done. So um, building is key, um, uh, creating is key. Um, if you're like me, and if you are, you know, running a company or if you're running a team, uh, please look after your engineers. Uh, you know, the creative tech spirit, the force behind um, everything, forms all, everything about all the products. Um, and if you're an engineer or a builder like me, uh, keep building stuff, um, keep innovating, keep, solving, keep asking questions, and, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to be with us. And we have uh, quite a few questions coming up in the Q&A section. So you have fans, I see, also. So the first question is from Claire Goodwin. And it is, what is your favorite part of designing synthesizers? That's the first question. And then there is right away a second question. So do you have any new designs on the horizon that you could give us an insight info? So first, what's, what's your favorite, favorite part? part? Um, yes. Favorite part of designing synthesizers. Um, this is a really hard question. Um, I only I'm good. I'm going to give the uh, the answer that I usually give, which is um, that moment when you first have a mock-up. So, for example, if we're designing this, uh, you. would You'd first make a mock-up of this before you make a kind of production version of it, obviously. Uh, it'll be pieces of plastic stuck together, maybe. You know, the, there's different kinds of prototyping. But when I see the first physical thing, that's when I get the most excited. Mm -hmm. and actually, it's not when I hear the first sound, because that is more gradual and incremental. It's not like a single yeah. point where you're like, yeah, you know, I cracked it. Yeah. Um, but when you have physical form, that's the moment I, that I can Interesting. Say. So really tangible cool. tech, which yes. is allowing great sound, is something which is exciting. And yeah. the second part of the question, do you have any new designs on the horizon that you could give us an inside info? My God, and your new questions are coming up. We have to yeah, hurry up. You know, yes. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, I, have, uh, I have plans. I don't have designs right now because we're really busy setting up the company. Cork Germany was only founded uh, at the 
very end of last year and we only got our team together a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So we're really in the setup phase right now. Um, I do have some ideas lingering in my head. Um, I also feel that um, it's not really about my ideas and it's about discovering new ideas with the team. Mm -hmm. So this is, so if I can say one thing, I am trying to design a team that would uh, come up with new designs uh, to be made. So how that's where you, I how am. How big is your team? How many are you in your team? So it's, uh, it's a team of six engineers and, and one um, administrative position. Mm -hmm. uh, the six engineers includes myself and the aforementioned Maximilian Rest who I've worked with for quite a long time. Okay, so togetherness, this is great. Yep. So the next question is, why do you think in an era where when a laptop can be used to perform music on an infinite number of virtual instruments, so why do you think that people are so keen to use physical products that are by their nature more limited in their musical scope? And this is a question by Joe Sparrow. I think that, um, I think with the return of hardware in, I guess, the last 10 years, um, it's it's very evident that, um, put simply, hardware is more fun than using the computer. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, it's a very kind of uh, one-dimensional statement I just made. But um, when, or just before I started making instruments, um, or before I joined Korg, uh, workstations were the, were the thing. They were the main, you know, they were the flagship instruments at many uh, music tech companies. Um, and that felt a bit boring to me. I don't want to slag off other core products because <laughs> they still <laughs> exist. But I think, you know, if, if you have a computer inside that can do so many different things and it's so kind of feature packed and so functional and you might as well be looking at a screen and, and using a mouse. And mm. I think not just hardware, but I think hardware that's simple and that does have limits is actually a very, very liberating um, tool for, for creation. Great. Talking about tools for creation, we have a question of Francisco Nauraf. I hope I pronounce this word uh, uh, nice. Nauraf, yes. Question is, do you think it is possible to create a hybrid sense with AI? Um, yeah, I'm sure you could. But I don't know. I think, yeah, this is one... <laughs> You know, it's it's quite similar to the you know what do you, what do you think about the future of music? Yeah. And, you know, and um, with big data and AI and um, you know all these kind of very kind of futuristic technological ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I am interested in these aspects, but I don't really think that they would. It would take a lot more time for them to come into common music making. And I say this because. Like I said, the music tech industry isn't so big. It's not big enough that it can drive these big um, and resource and development heavy um, new technologies uh, to come into the, to the mainstream. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if you look back, I mean, the devices we use in here, most of them use, use ARM processors, ARM core processors, which are only available to us synth people because they're used in mobile phones. And it seems, if you look back at history, music tech has always just kind of thrived on uh, gathering the leftovers of bigger tech. Um, and you could say, yeah, that's parasitic to bigger business, but also it's a really exciting thing. It's like, it's like hacking what they were meant for. You know, it's like mm -hmm. hacking the technology for, for smartphones and putting them in a synth. Or it's like, so I think it's more of like a trickle down kind of thing with new emerging technologies like AI, um, which isn't to say I'm not looking forward to them. I think it's going to take a bit more time for us to really realize how they would be applied to music tech. OK, well, I would love to challenge you on this one. I'm totally into this um, future of music tech. And sort of, unfortunately, we do not have the time. So um, Tatsuya, thank you so much for being with us thank today you. and to have shared this. This looks very futuristic to me, actually, already. So this looks very good at any case, very excellent design and very good uh, uh, visual. Oh, yeah, sorry. Can I say thanks to the guys at Catalyst and director Roman and Nadia for orchestrating all the visuals. Really fantastic stuff. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you also to the technicians who make this all happen. This is wonderful. Thank you so much.